Hello. Yes, can I speak to Dawn Wells, please? She is speaking to you. How are you? Dawn, it's Ray Carr from Cleveland, Ohio. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing? I am incredible, and I'm just honored um, to be able to speak with you today. Well, thank you. Did I raise you? Were you just a little kid? Yes. Um, well, yes, I've, I've watched you um, a lot drama throughout my life, and it's been a, a blessing, and you've helped me get through a lot of tough years for myself. So That's nice. You know, and, and I don't know what today what's what's on television that could help you with those, help you out. Everything's so crazy right now. You know, I don't even watch modern television anymore. I just watch the shows that I liked when I was younger, uh, some of the cartoons that I grew up with, and uh, and sports. That's pretty much all I watch. Yeah, I do too. I'm the same way. I'm a news junkie as well, but the stuff I I, I just think it's so off the wall that I don't know how you're raising kids. <laughs> Yeah, my, thankfully my son's in his 30s now, so I don't have to really worry about that too much. But it's uh, for those people that have younger children, it's got to be very difficult. And you watch all these reality shows, and they're so, so people are so rude to each other, and they're and mean. And yes, it's also mean spirited. And not only that, everything is half naked. I mean, Marianne, you know, we hardly show the navel or, or, or Ginger's cleavage. Now you've got Miley Cyrus topless on the piano and all this stuff, or, or, or ads on buses with Levi's with girls in bras, and you're thinking, what do you say to that eight-year-old child? <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah, they, 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 their image of a woman is a lot different than the image of a woman was in the 70s or late 60s. Um, yes, yes. It's like people don't have any respect for decency anymore, and they want to see how outrageous they can go and push the envelope, and that's more important to them than, than quality. And I think that's because the talent isn't out there like it used to be. Well, and you also wonder, uh, once that's all done, what's next? Then you've got to go back to Walt Disney. You know, then you've got to go back to feeling good about things and things being good. You can't go much further. <laughs> right, right, and well, cable will continue to get more egregious as time goes on because they they have more um, leeway to get that way. But uh, network TV, from what I read, isn't doing very well, so they they have to be real careful because they're losing viewership all the time. And it's mainly, I think, they're really geared now by the stars. Who you know, is it Charlie Sheen doing it, somebody, or is it somebody else doing a series that you want to see more than what the series about? Oh yeah, absolutely, right. <laughs> Um, when you were doing Gilligan's Island, uh, Don, um, you beat out over 350 other people for that particular role of Marianne, which, which in and of itself is, is, is amazing. You you did an incredible job. But when you went into that, um, what was going through your mind as you were rehearsing or trying out for that role? Well, you know, when you're when you're working as a freelancer and as a young woman coming into town, you're up for just about everything that's an ingenue. You know, whether it's Wild West or Gunsmoke or or 77 Sunset Strip, or Hawaii and I, or whatever, you're in that pool of ingenues that probably there's 50 of you that are kind of circulating through the city. And and sometimes you get a role that knocks their socks off. Sometimes you disappear. Sometimes you never know. And um, I when I auditioned for the role, they'd already made the pilot. I didn't know much about it. And I went into the uh, 20th Century Fox studios and met with Sherwood Schwartz and you do that kind of stuff all the time this wasn't a big deal you know you go in and audition and uh, we had a lovely conversation and uh, they called I think my agent called and said how'd she do and uh, he said she's too smart to play Marianne and I just said excuse me she you know first of all the character's not dumb but I guess Sherwood and I were quipping and I have a cute sense of humor, and I think we're kind of going back and forth. And I think he thought, whoops, wait a minute, maybe she's not the sweet little girl from Kansas. So when they got ready to cast, they said, we, we're going to cast her the second, we're going to test her the second time around. You know, we'll go through the first 20 or 50 or whatever, and we'll test her the second. And my agent said, test her now or you don't test her. Ah. So they tested me, and they tested me, and I got the highest rating of the testing because I knew who she was. I knew she was sweet. I knew she'd be in gingham. I, I knew the character. I mean, I knew it's it's kind of me growing up, basically, and it was the same with the professor. He was he was auditioning at the same time, and Ethel Weinert, who was vice president of the studio, said, "I want you to take off your shirt." He said, "I'm not going to take off my shirt." No, I think you need to take off your shirt. He said, "I'm not taking off my shirt." He wasn't a muscle man. He wasn't supposed to be a muscle man, but he too stood up for what he wanted. And I'd have. Um, executives, you know, we tested for a week and I was wearing that gingham top and I and every every office in CBS had a little T V monitor. And the, the executives would say, Oh, I'm so sick of looking at you in that gingham top for five days you wear the same clothes. 
But you realize now it's not the same at all. But it was really kind of, you just do that, and you're one of 50 or however many it ends up, and you don't know until they start negotiating. You know, maybe my my agent would have asked too much money. Maybe somebody else is, was doing somebody a favor. And I was just lucky. I mean, I, I think I am the character. I think I knew the character. And I think uh, the casting was right. Yes. Uh, Don Wells, our special guest here on the Ray Carr Show. Don, you grew up in uh, Reno, Nevada. That's a good Marianne place, isn't it? Gambling, instant divorce, legal process. <laughs> That's where Marianne was raised. <laughs> wow. And, and, and you were able to survive that, and you were the representative um, for Nevada in the Miss America contest. Yes, yes, and Reno, you know, that's mostly tourists. And way back then, you came to Nevada to get a divorce because you could be a resident in six weeks, and once you were a resident, you could get divorced, so that wasn't it. And pro- I totally believe the prostitution should be legal. I was talking to the madam of, of one of the, the houses not long ago when Karen, Helen Mirren did that movie. Yeah. And I said, it takes, it, takes, it takes the guys out of the bar picking up girls you don't know, girls getting beaten up, and so on and so forth. It regulates it. And and it, it protects both the male and the female, and why shouldn't it be legal? You know, everybody's hooking up with everybody nowadays. You don't know what you're doing. It's totally different than my generation. So, I mean, I, I really feel that it's, it's, it's um, organized and it's controlled and it's disease-inspected, and if you're drunk and drug, you're not allowed into the place and so on. So I kind of don't really see anything wrong with it because everything's sort of open now anyway. So I, Marianne sort of is kind of a practicality, I think. Well, you also have a very important book out called The Guide to Life, What Would Marianne Do? Let's let's explore that a little bit. Um, when did that all start for you? When did you start writing this? Well, I started writing it a couple of years ago, but it's been on my mind because of the people I meet, the you, the people that are now in their 30s, the 18-year-old, the 12-year-old that says, I watched this show with my dad. And I'm thinking, okay, what, what are these three generations of men looking at? What are, what are girls thinking about? Is it all the Kardashians? Do we all have to have topless clothes? Do we all have to sing sexy on the piano? I wasn't raised that way. I went out and played softball. And I grew up in Reno where there were topless dancers at the hotels. I mean, it's not that I was protected in Iowa from seeing anything, but it's, it's, it's the way civilization is today. And how would Marianne handle it? I'm not a goody two-shoes, but there's nothing wrong with saying thank you. There's nothing wrong with opening the door for an old lady. There's nothing wrong with holding out. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Manners are important. I'm not telling you you have to be a goody two-shoes. I'm telling you you have to live in this civilization today. And if we all paid attention to this, how much better the world would be. So it isn't, it is, I just think it's common sense, basically. What, what is the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that you see with the uh, millennials and the younger generation that really appall you, be, besides the um, sexual exploitation? Well, the sexual activity just blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's something that, that uh, is a hard one. I don't have children, and it's a hard one because you can't lock your kids up and if you give them the moral standards that they can make the decisions for themselves. And I think that's what happens. I think what's also happening is we are families that are divorced and remarried and so on with stepchildren in the house. That's a little different, too, because the man you marry may be freer with his kids than you are with your daughter, et cetera. So that's, a, that's something that, that everybody has to adjust to. But I think the world's in a pretty good place. I mean, I, you know, I went through the 60s and the hippies and the drugs and the, and the ODing on heroin and all that kind of stuff, the Vietnam War. We're in a better place now. I think the, I think the country is sort of settled into to a, to a better respect for each other, even though we're seeing some of this stuff on television. I think the kids are kind of bored with it. They've seen it so much. Yeah, you they're know? desensitized. Yeah, that's the right word, sure. So I, I think every generation has something new, and I think we have to grasp it. I think the world in war is the, is the most horrible thing. I mean, I think now we're all holding our breath we're not going to get bombed or hydrogen bombs or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. I think we're living in a little bit of fear. Because you don't want to live like tomorrow's the last day, so you still have to plan for the rest of your life and what kind of a parent you want to be if you want to be a parent. And and kindness and caring. I mean, I can hardly go buy a puppy that I know but needs feeding. I can't go buy somebody on a corner who's standing out there wants 75 cents. So what if you give it to him? So what if he's going to go buy it for beer? How would you like to be having nothing in your life and standing on that corner? Right. I, I, I try to put myself in other people's places. And I'm not saying what they're doing is right and all that, but where's the human compassion? Well, yeah, there's a, a lot of people become kind of cold and callous towards that, and there's a lot of people that are legitimately in need of help. Yes, 
and there are people ripping you off, too. I mean, I, we understand that. But I don't feel bad if I've given somebody a dollar that maybe didn't have it or maybe thought, gee, I got my extra dollar. I had a cute thing happen to me, not cute, about four or five years ago I was moving, and I, I, I had an underpass by my house. It was just pouring rain. And I went under the underpass two or three times, and there's a woman there probably in her 50s maybe with a dog and all her stuff and plastic bags and everything shivering in the rain. And I, I had a, a guy that was helping me clean my garage, and I said, Robert, here's $20. Please go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Get 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 chicken without bones. Get mashed potatoes. Get as much hot coffee you could get so that the dog could have a little bit and she could have a little bit, and please take it to her. <laughs> he drove it and he handed it to her, and she threw it at him. She said, I'm not eating fast food. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, there you go. <laughs> wow. I'm not eating fast food. Wow. <laughs> I don't eat fast food. I don't know what to expect, but I maybe just – Maybe just a beer. I don't know what she wanted, but I laughed about that, and I thought, well, it didn't hurt me to be kind. But No, no, you did the right thing. You didn't take advantage of it. <laughs> you, your heart was in the right place. Sometimes there's a lot of people out there that are in those situations that have a lot more issues than, than you know, food can handle. But so they they need a lot more help, unfortunately. Exactly, and mental, uh, mental health with it. Sure. Well, so. Sure. Sure. Let me ask you, let, let me delve into Gilligan's Island for a bit. Uh, Marianne Summers, of course, probably – well, it's my favorite character, but, uh, you know, Roy Hinckley, the professor, which a lot of people didn't know what his name was on the show, I think he played such a pivotal role in balancing everybody out. No question. I think so, too. He covered everything. He was he was um, the moral compass. This is what we do, and this is how we do it. He was kind and authoritative. He was very handsome, very smart, and really, truthfully, as a person, he had the best sense of humor. <laughs> He had a great sense of humor. You wouldn't know it. Jim Backus was funny all the time. And Bob was physical, a physical comedy. I just had the greatest time. I'm, a, I'm now, I play poker about every once a month at my house, a bunch of friends, you know, $10 buy and it's no big deal. But, I, but I'm playing with Bob Denver's little boy, who's now 30. Patrick, if you saw the, if you saw the um, Jack and the Beanstalk and the, and the Giant, well, Patrick was dressed as Gilligan, and he was five. Huh. He played He played the little kid while Alan Hale played the giant. And I'm looking at Patrick now. He does all these special effects for Nickelodeon. I said, oh my God, I remember you when you were five years old in your, in your father's outfit. So it's really yeah. kind of nice. I also see Alan Hale's granddaughter. So it's, there's a little bit of us still happening, which is nice. She's a stand-up comic. So it's really kind of fun to see what happens to us. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that show, um, when it was going on, it didn't. It only lasted for three years, if I'm not mistaken. And and still, it's being played over and over in like you know, hundred different languages all over the world, which is remarkable when you think about. They only made three years of the show, right? Ninety-eight episodes, though, which would be about a five-year run today. But yeah. you know, there isn't any dating it. There's no cars or political issues or anything that would say, "Oh my, that was the '60s." <laughs> you didn't see any of that. It's it was how smart could he be? It's Robinson Crusoe. We all wanted to be on that island and see what we do. <laughs> Looking back on it, is there anything that you wish they would have done differently? Um, no, I don't think so, other than the billing. <laughs> no, I don't think that, no. Because uh, I don't think you could have gone any further. I don't think you should have had any romances. I don't think you should. It was always good and bad. Uh, be helpful or not be helpful. Who can we be kind to? Uh, I, I, but without shoving it down your throat. It wasn't really Disney. And I don't mean Disney shoving it down your throat. I don't mean that. But you know when you go to a Disney movie, it's going to be a goody two-shoes movie. Yeah. You don't know necessarily about this one. But the dream sequences were so much fun. Oh, I yeah. yeah. Like dictators and all that kind of stuff. That was that was fun, too. And, and you had different uh, people that, you know, passed by and dropped down the island. Like um, I remember the, the, the Mosquitoes were one of those bands that, that stopped That's by. That's right. That's right. And, and, and the, uh, the dictator and all that kind of stuff. It was fun. How much fun it would be to write those shows? <laughs> what possible proofs can you be behind? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so Don, what you're acting today? I mean, tell me some of the roles that you're playing now. Well, the first thing I did was I kind of wanted to break the image. The first play I went out and did was Alan the Pussycat, which was uh, one of my favorite plays. Went beautifully written, very very funny, and I played a, a hooker with a heart. So I, I really loved it, and I sort of changed the image a little bit. But she was a nice hooker, so it's okay. I was laughing the other day. I said with the, to a um, director, I said, you know, it would be kind of cool to do it now. Here's, here's she's so old. 
How, how is she going to be on the street? And the guy's a writer who can't get arrested, and here we are in the last stages of our life. Take the same play, but I think it'd be very funny. The the movie was much more off color than uh, than the play, but I think it's one of the best plays ever, one of the funniest plays ever written. I'm going to do Steel Magnolias now. I'm going to play Weezer, the Shirley MacLaine role, and I, I always kind of want to break. I kind of want you to come out and go, "Wow, I didn't know she could do that," because you you would assume I'm playing this little ingenue. Well, not at this point, but I could be playing Aunt B maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean you're um, you're talented enough to do pretty much pull anything off. So that's you know that's a testament to your great ability. Well, I'm I'm, I'm trained as an actress, and I like I like something w- w- you know with some meat to it. I mean I've done a lot of very serious plays, which I like to do. But you, I don't know that you would want to come and see me do Lion in Winter, which I did. Yes, you would if you were sort of a theater goer. But you might want to see Marianne do a musical. I did. They're playing our song. Almost killed me. I don't sing. So. <laughs> It almost killed me, but I got a chance to do it. Life, you know, life is what you make it. And I don't have kids, but I do speak to a lot of schools. And there's a dream in your heart as a kid, no matter what age it is. You might want to be the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, or you might want to be an astronaut, or you might want to teach chemistry. You don't know what's in your heart. I didn't want to be an actress. I wanted to be a ballerina. That's what I wanted to be. But my knees dislocated, and I never played a sport. So I took my, you know, off-hour courses in drama. Not thinking in a million years that's what I do. I'm a chemistry major. If I had to do it over again, I think I'd go into medicine. I've been connected with the Children's Hospital in Missouri for a long time with a telethon, and I've watched a facial cranial reconstruction on a four-month-old baby. I stood over the table. I watched a hip replacement. And with all this genetics, how you can alter things, and now I think that's what I would be doing. But because of who I am, who Mary Ann was, I have the opportunity, too, of exploring it and seeing it. You wouldn't just let a secretary at the bank go in and see what I saw. So I feel I've been blessed even so. I've made a wonderful uh, career and, and fans all over the world, but it's also given me an opportunity of of seeing the world in another way. Yeah, your celebrity is, is opens a few doors for you in some other fields or some other parts of life, which has been wonderful, so you can see that. Um, sometimes things happen to us for a reason, and you know, hurting your knee, uh, becoming trying to become a ballerina probably opened the door for you to be an actress, and look how it turned out, and really, um, all of us are the beneficiaries of all that. Yeah, isn't that funny? And how about you? Did you want to do what you're doing your whole life? Well, yes, actually, I wanted to, I kind of wanted to do a talk show like Johnny Carson. I'm not Johnny Carson, but I kind of wanted to have that uh, feel feel to the show where, you know, I have a couple of people on the couch next to me, or, you know, do that kind of stuff. I I never wanted to get into something really heavy, but I want to talk and find out who the person, actor or actress or a musician is. I want to find out who they are. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to do a talk show. I would love to do a talk show. Let you and I go on the road. Oh, uh, Dawn, I would love that because I think you... I mean, I'm curious about that. I really am. I think there's so much we can learn from each other if we listen. Right, right. And that's the thing. There's a lot of people that don't listen. I, I watch a lot of interviews and listen to a lot of them. And some, like Larry King... When he was on the radio before he was on TV, he was the best. I don't think there was anybody better interviewing people. Um, He was good on TV, too, but it was a different kind of a setting. So everything was more rushed, I think. Yeah. When you're on radio, you you could take time to open the story and expand on that. And you have an hour or two hours on the air, which in TV you don't have that kind of freedom. Right, and you're you're worried the person who you're interviewing is worried how they look. And, and they have to come in every 15 minutes in the commercial and powder your nose and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's very different than – I always feel when you're on the radio, I really am talking to you. I mean, I'm a radio listener. I mean, what people do in the car, for crying out loud. If you're riding for eight hours, what are you doing? I'm always listening, and I'm always listening to talk radio more than music because I don't carry a tune, so I really I, – I, I appreciate it, but I can't sing along with it. But I'll, I, I keep – I'm a news junkie. I keep CNN on all the time. I mean, I, it's way in the back of my head because I think we've got to keep up with what this world is doing. I hate to tell you where we're going. We don't know. But the kids today are a little blasé. It's all the rock and roll. They're all listening to stuff. When do they tune in and say, what can I do to make this world better? Or I, what kind of a person do I want to marry? What kind of a parent do I want to be? I have, I have a friend, that, that, an acquaintance actually, in Columbia, Missouri, where I went to college and where I did a telethon for 15 years for the Miracle Network. And this family who I adore has six children. And I said, how do you manage it from age 14 to 6 or something? A lot of kids. And she said, well, we've got a new, a new philosophy. I said, what is it? She said, we just built a new house. We built a new house with the second floor with all the kids' bedrooms and bathrooms and no doors except in the bathroom. 
all oh. the doors are off. So, if you want to go dress and you don't want your brother to see you, go in the bathroom. But nothing is being hidden. Nothing is being whispered about. They are, you don't have to go through their drawers. You can see what they're doing. And I said, how are the kids adjusting to it? She said, they love it. It's their floor. You know, mom and dad are downstairs. But nothing really wrong is going on. And I thought, what a great step to take. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I never really thought about doing that. But that's, that's probably a very inventive and uh, adventurous yeah. idea. Yeah, I think it is, too. I think it is, too. Raising children in this day and age is extremely difficult, as we mentioned before, and I don't know if I'd ever want to go through it again. I, I, you know, I just have one child, and it's just really, really tough trying to give them the good moral foundation when they get just the opposite in their daily life at school or From in their friends and the advertisements. Did you have a boy or a girl? A boy. A boy. Probably what easier as a dad, although... I'm not so sure the girl looking to the dad is really looking to the dad for for guidance, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think she probably listens to you more than she listens to her mother because the mother probably fights with the girl. There's that competition. I don't know how it is with the son. I, I don't know that because I, I, my brother and sister were adopted and they didn't live with me, so I don't know what it's like to live with a little boy. But, uh, but I, it's just children. If you love them and if you give them the right direction, that's all you can do. That's all you can do. Yeah, when you get to share stuff, you know, I, I play baseball. That's my uh, thing other, other than radio that I do is I, I'm an athlete. So uh, I, that's what I grew up doing is playing baseball all the time. And I shared that with my son, and we didn't always get along because, you know, I had my way of wanting him to do things, and he had his way. And so you kind of sure. you learn to grow through those, you know, those pains of, of adolescence. And, uh, and we, we both came out at the other end uh, better because of it. Well, and if you try to dominate completely – and you take all that uh, ingenuity or dreams or rebellion uh, away, then you've only raised something that you think. You haven't raised what the child really is. I mean, uh, what would you do if you had uh, Picasso as your kid? <laughs> all of a sudden, what are you painting these pictures? What is this? What are we? Well, all of a sudden, but that, that soul of Picasso was on that canvas. So that soul of your child is somewhere. He's either going to be a student, he's going to be an athlete, he's going to be a bookworm, he's going to be a Romeo, he's going to be a flake. I mean, you don't really know. You, you give him the best you can, and nowadays with everything we're watching, there's a lot of influence. But I think almost we've gone over the edge, so the kids are, are going, wait a minute. I think we've gone a little too far, and I think the kids are seeing it. Yeah, I do. I, I think you're right. We should do a podcast on that, Dawn. I'd love to. I really want to do a radio show. I think, I think Marianne has a lot to say, and I don't mean Anita Bryant, goody two-shoes. I think it's practicality, good sense kind of thing. No, I, I, I'd love to do something with you. I, I think we should. I, I think it's, I don't know who'd listen to us, but, but they'd listen to you. They might think Marianne's over the hill, but I'm not. No, you're not. You're not. You know? No, I think there's a lot of young people that have never been exposed to Marianne like, like my generation has, and that's kind of a good thing because they would, you know, they, you have a good voice, you have a good presence on the, on the radio, and they would hear that. Um, to them, I don't know if celebrity is is really as important as with the message that they hear. Yes, and Marianne had a message. She did. Whether you say it or not, you say, okay, you've got these seven people. What, what Somebody said it was the seven deadly sins, something, some, somebody, you know, some PR wrote, wrote about it. But every person has a purpose. Every person is there. Alan was the, the head of all of this. He was going to get us off the island. Bob just kept making mistakes, but we loved him anyway. That's like a little kid in school that can't quite get it, but you love him anyway. Mary Ann cooked and she cleaned. Ginger was your fantasy. I mean, if the professor could almost fix anything. You take everybody in this world and put them together like that, we all are a little bit of everybody. Yeah. Yeah, and the smart people are the ones that learn to listen and try to improve themselves, and the people that usually have a lot of trouble are the ones that think that there's nothing wrong with them because we can always improve. And I you think a fourteen year old kid thinks he can improve. I don't think so. No, no, no. I, I that right. that I. But as as I'm like as an adult now, I look at myself. You know, every time I do something, I, I look back and I can I can do this better next time. And I I listen to interviews that I do, and I can always do them better. And I'm, yes, I'm the same way. Somebody said you're always criticizing. I said no, I'm not criticizing. There's no such thing being perfect. If you've done one perfect broadcast, you can say, my God, I was perfect. Well, no, something went wrong with the phone, or the person didn't answer your question that you thought you asked. You can't predict. And if you do the best job you can, each time you do it, you get a little better. 
Right. Well, here I am. Here I am with tons of correspondence, thinking I can't write another letter. I hate doing this. <laughs> you have to tie me to a desk. I hate paperwork so much. <laughs> what do you think of the computer now that we have um, the advantages of the internet and typing emails? Do you enjoy that much more than actually handwriting a letter? I don't like either one. Okay. I don't. I don't ever write a letter unless I'm just really communicating. I did with love letters and stuff years ago, and you'd write to your friends, but. Um, I hate to tell you I hate the computer. I, I have my little phone that I can give you messages on. My manager and I go round and round. We'll put it in your computer. I don't want to. I don't want to sit down with that machine. Tell me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Well, didn't you? I wrote it to you. I don't care. Talk to me. I'm not going to sit down and write you an answer. Now that's wrong. I totally know it's wrong. But where I am weak is that correspondence stuff. I will sit down and write you a little note. I would sit down and do 40 pieces of fan mail with a little note to each of you. For me to sit down and write my insurance company or whatever, whatever, I find it a total bore. That's why I have an assistant. <laughs> my assistant can't go sing and dance. I can't sit down and do shorthand. <laughs> and I hate it. So I have to force myself. Monday mornings at 9 o'clock from 9 to 12, I'm making this up. But that's going to be my routine. And I have to do it and get it over with. Because if it hangs over my head, it's like the last two days, I don't know why I'm telling you my whole life. The last two days, I thought my drawers are a mess. I look like a teenager. So what do I do? <laughs> my mother used to say, you put everything on your bed from the closet. You empty all your drawers and you start over. Yeah, because I reorganize <laughs> instead of keeping it neat all along. And I'm now saying, Dawn, you really ought to take a better look at what you're doing every day because you're overwhelmed. I pack and unpack so many times. And I'll still get somewhere and have forgotten the hairbrush or something. I hate all that kind of stuff. I'm more singing and dancing than I am that organization. But you have to be. That's life. You know? um, I, I definitely agree with that. And, uh, you know, the, hard, the hardest thing is to get used to. Once you overcome that, that mental block with the computer, it becomes second nature. Um, it, it really is a lot easier for me to communicate with people I otherwise can't call all the time. But I don't type real well. Well, I'm not type. I have to. I have to hand pick, you know, hand pick or whatever you call that. I can't just sit down and type a letter without looking at the keys. Oh, that's okay. It takes me twice as long as it takes you. Well, I, I, you know, I'm I'm just over fifty, and I went back to college in my late forties, and I had to learn how to write papers like the twenty somethings or the uh, teenagers, oh. and that was pretty yeah. that was pretty hard to adapt to that because everything in college is online or you got to type papers and send them uh, to your professor and it's not like it used to be so in those in that situation it's much more difficult well and then let's go back to my generation you didn't you'd have to go to the encyclopedia of the library to look it up right now you can punch it in your computer and it'll tell you what the population of Spain is and how it was founded otherwise you'd have to go research which took twice as long now it's at your fingertips and you can get it done easily but i i, I am wrong i know that I know that. But I, I can tell in a conversation with you what you're saying to me because I can read your voice. I can yeah. tell how you're saying it. You write a paragraph to me. I don't know whether you're angry or being critical or what. I can't tell. I, I don't know the feeling behind it. That's what bothers me. Yeah, yeah. the the, uh, the tone of, uh, of what you're really trying yeah. to say, right. So it's, it is difficult. But I think when you know somebody, um, when I know somebody real well and, and I, I look at a letter that they wrote me or a paragraph or something, I can kind of pretty much – surmise exactly where they're going with it. Okay, I'm going to ask you a very personal question. You say you're in your early 50s? Yes. Have you really written a love letter in your life? Oh, yeah, back back in, okay. back in when I was younger. By hand, by hand a love letter. Yes, um, back, yeah. in, back in the 80s. Yeah, but I wonder if that's happening now today. <gasps> no. Oh, no. No, you, you know what's happening is they're texting that things to people like uh text it's abbreviated and it's abbreviated <laughs> oh yeah the grammar is horrible forget the grammar yeah. it doesn't exist anymore how about i love you forever and ever until our souls meet across the ocean or something that somebody said in 1800 i don't know it, it, and, it, we're, and we're replacing it with wonderful things too you know we're so much smarter and so much able to communicate and stuff i'm not being critical but there's a little bit of that's missing in your kids that they aren't ever going to see right well they're not writing walt whitman let's put it that way but they're uh <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> no, but there are a lot of the kids, and I'm not speaking for all the kids, but uh, a lot of them really, it's more of a physical thing, and they're trying to hook up with somebody, you know. I don't know if that many of them are really trying to be so-called romantic. I don't think it's necessary. 
Yeah. I don't think I don't think it's necessary to say to the girl, "You have the most beautiful blue eyes I've ever seen. Let's dance." No. Hey, honey, want to hook up? Let's go to the prom. I mean, I think it's, it doesn't mean that there's lack of feeling, and maybe it's better. Maybe 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 you're all just buddies and just friends, and that's how it develops. You know, there was this uh, this illusion of romance, and you all expected everybody to be Clark Gable. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, and, I, and I think that I mean I, I'm that generation. If if I were on Match dot com or whatever it is, because I'm single, um, you would be meeting somebody your generation, perhaps, that understands it. If I went out with somebody 35, why didn't you open the door for me? I expected it. Well, nobody opened the door. I'm making that up, but you know what I mean. I mean, I really believe, as a parent, you try to pass on the best of yourself to your children. They don't always grasp it, but they may at 30. Oh, gosh, I got what my dad was telling me when I was 15. My son. The world is moving so fast, and they're looking, they're looking at things visually on television and the radio and stuff. They're telling you things so quickly. Your mind, I mean, this election is a big deal. This election is, if this, my manager's daughter, it's her first election. I said, boy, you vote, Alexia. You will never have an election like this in another three or four generations. This was huge. Get involved with it. Whatever side you're on, learn what's going on. This is not ho hum. Right. This election was not ho hum. You were passionate about it. Whatever side you were on, and I think that's kind of a good thing. I think that's kind of it's, we're not just thinking the world's going to be the way we want it. No, no, no. It's that's definitely not that. You're right. And you know, my son is really a very magnanimous young man, and he's he looks out for well. My mother and I live very close to each other, and he comes over and visits both of us a lot, and. Uh, we hang out. It's really a, it's wonderful that things have turned out the way they have. Well, and that's fabulous for you, and I really, I, 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 you are so blessed. I have a godson that actually, um, his his mother is, is deaf, and she's been my goddaughter forever. She's six feet tall and absolutely beautiful. And Matthew is sophomore in high school, and um, she said, Cindy called me, and she said, you know, Matthew and I have had a little to do. And I said, what is it? She said, well. His girlfriend sent him a picture on the telephone, topless. Huh. And he came out of the bedroom. He said, Mom, look at this. What do I do about it? I went, whoa, Cindy, is that a good thing? <laughs> he didn't go show it to his friends. He said, Mom, what, what, what do you think we ought to do about this? So she and her son talked, and they called the mother of the girl. So the four of them got on the phone. Well, what a wonderful way to handle that. Yeah. Where did he get the courage to go to his mother? I mean, I just think that's a, it's a perfect example of what can happen. And, of course, the kids are going to do that, and so they just all discussed it. I don't know what's happened since then. I don't know. But I thought it was a wonderful way that he was open enough. She didn't panic. Nobody screamed and yelled, don't ever talk to her again, or go ahead and tell your boyfriends or whatever, you know. But it was handled in, in a very mature way. My generation, my mother knew where I was every single minute. And I have two or three stories if you have another five minutes to tell you. I lived with my mother alone in Reno. My father and mother were divorced. He lived in Las Vegas, remarried. Mother and stepmother were good friends, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, I've just lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, and my mother, my mother knew coming and going where I was at, at every single second. So you, you get to a point where uh, do you tell her, do you not tell her, do you, do you know, blah, blah, blah. So I'm now a junior. I've been to Stevens College, a women's college, in Missouri from Nevada, between my sophomore and junior year, I then registered at the University of Washington. And I was dating the quarterback, who was a lovely guy who lived in Los Angeles. So my senior year in college, Al wanted to pick me up in Reno by car and drive me to Seattle. My mother went, oh, I don't know, that's 11 hours in a car with a guy? I'm not sure. But he said, she said yes. So he picked me up, and we were driving somewhere in Oregon. I was sound asleep with my head against the window when the highway patrol pulled us over. And I said, oh, my God, Al, were you speeding? He said, I don't think so. He rolled down the window, and the policeman said, is there a Don Wells in the car? Call your mother. No. That means my mother had to call the highway patrol. <laughs> my mother had to say, look for that Ford or whatever it was. That's bad enough, okay? I was 20. That's bad enough. Now, huh. five or six or eight years ago, I'm in the Solomon Islands. No running water. No electricity, and five of my friends from Stevens College climbed the mountains in Rwanda with the gorillas, and we were now in the Solomon Islands with a photographer with no white women have ever been before, people living in huts upon stilts, all of that, for three weeks. No communication with anybody at home, and my mother was alone, wondering whether a headhunter got me or not. And as I 
flew from the little tiny airport, the Solomon Islands, to Sydney to catch a plane. I am walking in the airport, and a pilot comes to me, and he said, aren't you Marianne on Gilligan's Island? I said, yes. He said, your mother's been looking for you all day. Oh, my and God. I, oh, yeah. I'm 60 years old. And my mother found me at the airport in Sydney, Australia. Well, so I'm saying well, you can't get away from it. <laughs> my mother knew where I was every minute. <laughs> it's funny. My mom listens to every radio show I've ever done. So she's, you know, whenever I go on in the morning, she's always listening. So I always got to make sure I, I conduct myself in a professional manner at all times. Exactly. And that doesn't hurt you, does it? No, I like it. It's, it's part of who I am. I don't want to be, you know, dirty and, and filthy. Yeah. It's not my style. Well, and you do with your girlfriends. We we sang dirty songs and all that kind of stuff. You do as a teenager. What can you really say? Nowadays, they're half naked. We couldn't do that. But you do. You kind of go through that rebellion, but not drugs that's going to change your mind, you know, or, or alcohol. Right. You know, I'm sure you ever tried a beer and all of that, but you don't try shooting up something because you don't know what it's going to do. That's a whole different culture now. That's what's frightening. You might try something. You don't know what it's going to do to you. You don't know what's in it. What's that wonderful thing? Whatever You know when you're drinking a scotch and soda, it's scotch and soda. If you go to a party and it's punch, you don't know what's in there. If you're taking a pill, you don't know what's in there. There's a big difference. Well, yeah, I, I never did drugs, and, uh, you know, I haven't, had a, I haven't drank in two decades, and I don't smoke. So I try yeah. to stay out of all that because it, the reason I don't do it isn't because I had a problem with it. It's more because... I don't function well under that. So I thought, if I want to be at my best, I've got to, you know, put the best things in my body. Exactly. And you have to be, your mind has to be there. Exactly. You know, you, 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 there's a lot of things you've got to comprehend now. And you can't do that if you're stoned or drugged out on something. And then you get addicted and you can't help it. I mean, my generation was a man with a golden arm and heroin. You know, well, I guess it, I come in Nevada. I'm sure there were a lot of musicians doing that. <laughs> Well, they weren't around very long. And you know? the 80s were full of cocaine. Yes, yes. And people said, you go to those parties. I said, oh, listen, I was in Hollywood 25 years. I was never invited to a cocaine party. I, I, uh, obviously, I was in the wrong crowd or the right crowd, but I was never, I was never, or same with, you know, shacking up with people. You're working 14 hours a day. You've got to look good. That's your responsibility. You can't party. Well, You can't party and fly American Airlines tomorrow. No, you can't. No, you can't. You can't live like that. And the people that did live like that didn't last in TV very long at all. And they just they weren't able to meet their um, their obligations. And what happened? Or they shaped up and said, "Whoops, yeah, there's some who've come back." You know, right? And 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 I'm not. I I sound like a a goody two shoes, but I, I think it's right and wrong, good health, bad health. Good judgment, bad judgment, and we all get mixed up in between. You don't always make the right decisions. There are things you did you didn't. You're sorry you did, or or but not so much that it risks everything. That's the hard thing. How far do I can I go without changing my my life, so to speak? Well, I, I agree, and um, I've learned a lot. I've been married a couple times, but now I'm single, and I've learned through you know trial and error that sometimes you can love somebody but not be able to live with somebody. Sure, sure, and it's more about matching who you are and where you're going than just the just the chemistry. Yeah, chemistry happens with a slow dance, and it's wonderful. And you think, what what kind of a father would he be, or would he, you know, would it was he too much of a drinker? Would it, would I wonder where he was on Friday night, or would I be the one supporting the family because he's incapable? But you don't when there's an attraction. But nowadays, it's so much easier to find out who we all are. We didn't know who we all were. We didn't have any of that stuff in my generation. We didn't even have television. I remember when, the, when the, my neighbor got one down the street, we all used to go and watch it. We played baseball after school. You know, I mean, th- you weren't into that culture. Now it's much more difficult. It's much more difficult even for somebody who thinks they're pretty on the right path to not be tempted. Oh, yeah. I you know, it's hard. I agree. And even to this day, I, I still, you know, and I still want to play baseball every day. I, 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 you know, that part of me has never died. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? It is, and I, I still play. I still play in an adult hardball league, and uh, and oh, I. Right. You know, it must be in great shape. I try to you're going to live forever. Well, <laughs> I, I just want to be able to do what I'm doing now, speaking to people like yourself, and learning, and uh, being able to do my craft, and you know, it just because not only do I learn stuff, but I also learn about you, and not just what the paper says in front of me. But, you know, you can get into stuff that is beyond what words in the papers say. 
who is, you know, who are you really? I mean, that's... Well, you're a good interviewer. See, you're not just asking trivial questions. You're listening and, you're, and, you're, and your mind is, is drawing things out of me. And there's a conversation going on. A lot of these radio people, it's just shock jock or it's, or it's uh, rock and roll and two or three minutes in between. I mean, I would love to do what you're doing. And, I, I, and I've, for, for quite a while I thought, what could, what could Marianne do? Is Marianne the hook or, or is it just because I'm a woman? I mean, I think there's there's things that I think that you don't, male and female. I think it'd be kind of fun to have a show where they're where your counterparts. Okay, you want to get up at eight o'clock in the morning. I want to sleep till noon. How do we handle this? That kind of thing. Men and women together, or it, it's really hard to be a, a female senator, perhaps, or to be the boss of four guys who don't want to listen to you. Women have done it forever, but now we're equal. We really are, except for having babies. We're all capable. You might be stronger than I am to lift something, but I might be more delicate at something that you can't do. But we all are more, I think the world has come to a better place. We're all educated the same. I mean, years ago, women couldn't do anything. You don't have to be a ball buster, pardon the expression, to get anything done now. True, true. My mother is part of the League of Women Voters here in the Cleveland area, and uh, she's very much for that, you know, um, well, of course, women had the right to vote in 1920. That was, you know, a big deal. And I can't believe it took that long for that to happen. I know. Isn't that something? Isn't and, that something? And, yeah, a lot of things women were just not able to do, um, especially in the entertainment industry. I mean, people frowned upon women songwriters and frowned upon women doing this and that. And um, I think it's just because a lot of men were afraid of them. They were intimidated by the talent of women. I think so, too, and, and, and I do think we are more equal than we are different. The difference is, is having the babies, and the difference is the nurturing. My dad nurtured me, not the same as a mother nurtures a baby. So that, that's, why, that's our, why there are two sexes. There is a difference between the two, but I think intellectually and emotionally, you could have a, a common ground, you yeah. know? I mean, I, I think, and I think you have to find it. We don't all think alike. Like my goddaughter, they're not having a Big Mac. They're not having it. They're not going to eat that junk food. Well, oh, yes, they are when they're with their kids. When they're with their friends, they're going to go get a Big Mac. But you've taught them by the time they're 25, you're right, that's a bunch of grease. I'm not making fun of Big Mac. I don't mean that. But, I mean, that's right. I shouldn't be eating chocolate. It's not good for my cholesterol. You can make up your own mind at 23. But you have to be guided to a certain point. And you can't be you can't be dictated to today because the because the emails and what you're seeing on your computer are telling you the opposite. Right. You, know, you can look up anything. You can you can you can discover anything. It wasn't my generation, for God's sake. We yeah, didn't know. I can remember we saw Mondo Kani when I was a senior in high school, and the native women in Africa were topless. Everybody went to see that movie. It had nothing to do with the culture whatsoever because the women were topless. Well, now you don't even pay attention to that stuff anymore. Right. You know? You're absolutely right. Don, if you ever want to do a um, – we can get a guest together, and you and I can interview them together if you ever want to do that. Uh, I'm up for it. I'd love it. And where are you located? Cleveland. Cleveland. I'm able to come through. I, I do things in Ohio. I'm able to come through one day and do it with you. I would. I mean, that might be kind of fun, too. Well, let me know when you're in Ohio, and I'll come and I'd like to, I'd like to meet you in person. I would like that, too. Oh, thank you, Don. And, um, and I appreciate your time, and the best of luck to you in your career. Thank you.